It's Friday, January 10th, 2020. This is Ashton Ellett here with another installment of the Two Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies at the University of Georgia. I'm here today with Mr. Charles Hazlett at his home in Decatur, Georgia. Mr. Hazlett is a graduate of the University of Georgia's Grady School of Journalism. He is also a member of the inaugural class of Grady College Fellows. Mr. Hazel began his career as a newspaper reporter covering Georgia politics, primarily for the Atlanta Journal in both Atlanta and Washington, before leaving the paper and spending more than 35 years in public relations and public affairs, most of that running his own firm. And now in retirement, he has sort of returned to journalism, which we'll talk about. For several years now, he has authored a blog called Trouble in God's Country that is focused on the problems facing rural Georgia, health, education, economics, etc. Based on our conversations leading to this interview, all three of those experiences has shaped his percep perceptions of Georgia politics. So, Charlie, thank you very much for, for agreeing to spend your Friday afternoon and Glad to do it. inviting me into your home here. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, so tell me, uh, just to start, tell me about your childhood and your upbringing. I was born and, and for the most part, grew up in, a, in Columbus, Mississippi, which was a uh, by Mississippi standards, sort of a mid-sized, small city in the northeastern part of the state. Um, I lived there except for a couple of years until I was um, 18. My family moved to Atlanta in 1965, just a, a, a few days before I began my senior year in high school. A very easy time to, to, to move. It, it actually turned out just fine, uh, but I'm... I'm Landed at a at um, at Briarcliff High School here in Atlanta, which mm -hmm. was not far from where we are now. It's been torn down, but mm -hmm. um, uh, but still have a lot of good friends from from that era as well. It was a it was a much easier transition than I thought it would be. So, what took your family from from Columbus, Mississippi, to Atlanta? My dad um, had been a uh, he was a World War II veteran who, as he would describe himself, was had no discernible skills except as a salesman, and he had. <laughs> Um, I had been a traveling salesman for different companies for a good number of years. He was working at the time for a company called BioLab, uh, which was then, and I think still is, based in Decatur, or at least in Georgia. And they promoted him and moved him over here as, as sales director. And, and, and so we moved over here. It was The truth is it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me in sure. terms of getting me out of of Columbus as much as I missed it initially and given me opportunities here. So did did your mom work outside the home or, or? um she did in Columbus. She did not here. Um and but in but yes, for most of my childhood in Columbus she worked as a secretary. She and she had been a school teacher and um and uh but once we moved here uh, no she did not. So your father's a salesman, um, mother, stay at home once once you get to Atlanta. Right. Did you grow up in a family that was particularly interested or attuned to politics? I can't really say that I did. I don't recall that 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 political discussions were 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 that common or were part of sort of the daily back and forth mm -hmm. uh, at, at our house. Um, uh, Dad, um, uh, I, as I got older, he was he was pretty conservative. Both mom and dad were. It was Mississippi. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, um, and I was probably uh, naturally more liberal than either of, of them were. And I can remember Dad joking about having gotten the wrong baby at the hospital <laughs> at, at at a couple of points, but um, I, I hope I think he was joking. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, I I really can't say that it was, mm -hmm. and and that was a time uh, that's something I've thought about. Um, now, I mean, politics sort of defines everything, including the your relationships with your neighbors and. And uh, friends and family, and and that wasn't the case then. I mean, it used to be that you you know you didn't 
You didn't mix politics or religion with business. Well, now they're all tangled up together. And it's the same thing with, with, uh, with the folks on the streets you live on. And then you had no idea what somebody with the next door neighbor's politics were. Mm. It was just, you know, that was, that was personal private business and, and you just didn't hear a lot of conversation about it. Right. So at least that's my childhood recollection of it. But well, do you, do you remember, was there a moment or a time period or an election where you did become interested in, in politics more actively or at least more cognizant of it? Um, I feel like I just sort of grew into it. Um, I was, um, I, I, I don't recall that it was um, uh, any kind of major preoccupation or obsession through high school. Um, of course, this was during the Vietnam War period. Right. So that sort of defined everything. And as I got to college and began um, studying journalism and history, and, and again, in the middle of, of all of that, um, of the unrest surrounding the, the, the Vietnam War and other issues, it was hard not to be interested in. And I, and I began taking courses in political science and, and history uh, at the university, uh, and, and, and that interest sort of grew, um, obviously grew. Um, I actually started out in Athens. I was a sports writer for the Daily News in Athens I, uh, and, and wound up being promoted to a cityside reporter while I was uh, still in, in school and covered local government and local politics there. And it, it does kind of get in your blood. It's, it's interesting. It's hard once you're into it to, uh, to, to get away from it. Okay. So why why did you choose uh, University of Georgia over Emory Universities right down right down the road? Uh, well, Emory was a pri- was and is a private school and was very expensive and was um, and is <laughs> and um, uh, the university was a public college. It had a I knew I wanted to study journalism. It had even then uh, one of the top ranked J schools in the country, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and I I thought okay. It's just, just serendipity or good luck or, or something, but I decided that that was where I'd try to go and luckily was accepted. I'm not sure I could get accepted today. But, <laughs> Lots but, of folks say that. That, that, that well, comes the up. S- the SATs are, are, uh, requirements are a good bit stiffer than they were when I was applying. So you've mentioned the Daily News that you you worked for Daily News while you were in Athens. Did you work for the Red and Black? No. You did not? No. I was uh, I, I probably would have, but um, I, you know, I, I I needed to work. I was um, uh, I had, was married, had a couple of kids in college, and um, uh, and was trying to finish school, and was largely paying my own way at that point. So I needed to work and wound up um, initially. Um, uh, I've forgotten how I got into this, but I took a little job, a summer job, actually uh, selling newspaper subscriptions door to door, believe it or not. And uh, they wound up offering me a job in the production department at the Daily News, Banner Herald, actually. Um, and uh, and that, after I've forgotten how long of that, uh, I also carried a paper route during that period. Um, and then um, uh, they offered me the sports writing job. This was in like 68. And then it was, I think, in 70 that I was moved over to the city side news covering um, position. And then in, at the end of 72, I finally took my last final exam in, in mid-December of 72 and reported to work for the Atlanta Journal on January 1st, 73. Well, so. now that you've explained all the all the different jobs and what you were doing during college, that 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 cast your the the, the length of time you were in college in a, in, right. in a different light. I was I was I had I was doing a number of things, but it was yeah. <laughs> so, so. Who who owned the uh, the Banner Herald and Daily News back it then? Was, those were Morris newspapers. They were Morris back yeah. then too. Yeah. Okay. So so how did you go from from Daily News to um, the journal, a decidedly not 
Morris. No, newspaper. it was um, well. I mean, you know, if you're if you're going to be a newspaper reporter in Georgia, you want to, you know, you 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 want to get to Atlanta, um, and it's the, the biggest paper and was the best paying and. And the journal back then was the largest circulation daily in the South. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I applied for both the journal and the Constitution. And uh, back then, they, they wouldn't hire you unless you had some usually daily experience um, in, a, at a, in a smaller market, at a smaller newspaper. Right. And so I had, you know, in addition to finally um, uh, persuading the university to give me my degree, um, was um, uh, had gotten that farm club experience under my belt, which was terrific. I mean, it was uh, I'm, I loved working at the Athens papers. Mm -hmm. So you, the Journal and the Constitution. By the time you were working there in the seventies, how were there different cultures still from Constitution to to Journal? Because historically, the Journal was more conservative as opposed to the the, the more Liberal or progressive, and that was constitution, and that was by design. I mean, you know, you had a um, liberal, moderate alternative in the constitution, and then editorially, you had the the more conservative journal. The journal, I, I, I really don't think that that bled into the news side coverage, um, and they were very different newsrooms. I mean, we. We were in the same building, but the journal was on the sixth floor and the Constitution was on the eighth floor. And, you know, the only time you really met was in the elevator. Um, so, uh, and, and the competition was very real. Mm. I mean, you, you um, uh, I, I had on all the beats that I was on, I had um, uh, really, I thought, good, good journalists, uh, Competing with me from the Constitution and other outlets, but but yeah, like Rick we talked about earlier. So Rick uh, Allen, Rick Allen, correct. Um, so um, in, in terms of the culture, was the, was the culture different? I, I I can't speak firsthand to the culture in the Constitution newsroom. I, uh, I I I'm not sure how to answer that. To tell you the truth, sure. So who were some of your colleagues that you, you worked with at the Journal, and who were some of your competitors, so to speak, uh, or your contemporaries, we'll yeah. say? Um, the, uh, at, the, at the Journal, um, in terms of the, of the political writers, mm -hmm. uh, David Norton um, was probably the lead political writer uh, for most of the time that I was there, and and arguably was one of the the best and most perceptive in the country at the time. Tom Crawford, we've talked sure. about. Uh, he and I were there um, and were good friends then and for the next 40 years. Um, uh, Cliff Green, um, uh, I could, I mean, Dale Russikoff um, was a young reporter who went off to the Washington Post, Fred Hyatt, uh, was started at the journal and went to the to the post as and is now it's still its editorial page editor, so it was you know it was um, in the same way that Athens and Rome and other smaller papers in Georgia were good training grounds for for Atlanta. Atlanta was a pretty good farm club for for um, uh, Washington and New York and other other papers. Constitution, um, Hal Raines mm -hmm. uh, was. Uh, uh, he sort of came into his own as a political writer there. He was initially the theater critic or the movie critic. And... Um, uh, there's a lot of similarities there when, well, it was, when you it, think about it. There's, there's kind of an interesting story there. Uh, there was another reporter there who passed away within the last year or two named Gregory James. Uh, is that a name you know? I've come across it in clippings. He, is, so. um, he was one of the best feature writers and, and reporters who worked there, um, and but he was doing sort of the entertainment writing and theater work and, and movie work, not a lot of theater work. Um, and out of the blue, the managing editor at the Constitution, Jim Minner, swapped them. Just he, um, uh, well, I, I actually got that backwards. Howell was doing the the um, uh, the the entertainment stuff. Uh, and and Greg was on 
news side primarily doing, doing politics, and Minter flipped them, and everybody thought, well, that's crazy. And it ended up being sort of a stroke of genius. I mean, um, uh, they're, they're, uh, it, Howell obviously was a, was a terrific uh, political writer and went on to a, a fine career in, in, New, in first, I think, in, in St. Pete and then in, in New York. Mm-hmm. And Greg went on to work as a, a columnist at Time and, and, uh, and the New York Times, and it seems like a couple of other stops along the way. So, um, uh, but those were some of the folks. Rick, we, I know you're gonna be talking to Rick Allen. He and I uh, were pretty good friends and competitors back then, a guy named Jim Gray. Uh, from uh, who had, uh, was our, uh, also a, a UNC graduate, as was Rick. Um, um, Rex Granham, Claudia Townsend, those were some of the Constitution folks. Rex and Claudia both went to the Carter White House from the paper. So as a political writer, what kind of stories were you? Were, were you were you at the, the Capitol? Were you... County, municipal government. What, what? started local, okay. um, uh, and which is you know where ninety nine point nine percent of us start. Uh, first in Athens, covering city hall in the county courthouse. Um, then in um, when I got to Atlanta, my first beat was to Cal County, mm-hmm. um, and uh, the which had been. Um, uh, as everything had been uh, under Democratic control since the dawn of time, and Republicans had just won the, the courthouse mm-hmm. in 72 and were taking office as I was assigned to that beat. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, uh, But I covered my, my, my beat in DeKalb County was, was the county government and the, the uh, police department, county mm-hmm. agencies, um, and, uh, and about once every other week, I uh, had to drive out to Lawrenceville just to make sure Gwinnett County was still there. <laughs> I mean, this was in like... It's a little different. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it was, it was very much a, a secondary beat. Um, after about a little less than two years, um, in DeKalb County, they moved me to the Fulton County Courthouse. Um, and I covered that for about two years and then they sent me to the Washington Bureau. The, the Atlanta in the '70s. What, what I'm thinking of is there, there's a lot of uh, obviously street crime, vice were, were major issues. There was a lot of talk of uh, you know, smut and pornography, and the, were those the kind of stories you were, you were covering in no, Atlanta? Not, not, not so much that. Um, I mean, that was those kinds of stories. Um, um, I mentioned the name Cliff Green earlier. My, he was uh, one of my best friends. He passed away a couple of years ago too, and uh, but he covered a lot of crime news, including a lot of uh, uh, of that more salacious sort of <laughs> stuff. Cliff was uh, infamous for getting tip offs about which strip club was going to be raided, and we uh, we would occasionally go there and be there when the cops came in. So. But um, uh, in the but parking I, lot or inside? Inside. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, just for our listeners, I want right. to clarify that. But no, I, that was not. You know, that wasn't one part of my beat per se. Uh, very often, anyway. But I, I would cover um, uh, crime stories in DeKalb County and cover the police department. But mostly, I covered the county government and the county politics and uh, and that sort of thing. And then. When I moved to Fulton County, it, that was more just covering the the uh, the machinations of of the of the county government as a whole. It was a bigger organization, right? And the politics, if anything, were even crazier, and um, um, uh, and it was a uh, and of course it was downtown Atlanta, so the, you had it was just a it was a bigger beat, and then right. um, and then they. Uh, when Carter won the uh, the presidency in '76, Cox expanded um, Atlanta and Cox, but Atlanta especially expanded its Washington presence, and I was sent up there as a, a sort of as part of that. Did you cover any any political campaigns while you were while you were down here? I covered 
I, I mostly covered local campaigns. Right. Um, in Athens, um, uh, I, I covered more. Um, back then, statewide campaigns, the candidates would would do fly arounds and drive arounds, and they would they would come through and do a Rotary Club speech or have a press conference at the airport uh, or come to the newspaper right. or whatever. And so I, you know, I, I really probably covered more statewide stuff as a reporter in Athens than I did in Atlanta because here I was, for the first four years, was focused more on local stuff than than statewide or, or, or federal. But, you know, I... I Interviewed Jimmy Carter as when he was running for governor in 19. What would that have been? 70. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Sam Nunn when he was running in for the Senate, and all the other candidates as well when they would come through Athens. I would be and the and the Daily News and the Banner Herald had separate staffs, um, but I was usually the Daily News guy who interviewed candidates who were running during that during that period. Statewide guys. I can remember Sam Nunn. Um, <clears throat> when he, well, he came through on one trip and, um, uh, he, I can remember him, uh, he was talking about nuclear throw weights, you know, MIRV missiles and nuclear throw weights and, and he still talks about those. He things. does. And, um, but you know, I was a local stupid reporter who I covered zoning hearings for crying out loud. And I've got this candidate for the United States Senate talking to me about something I know nothing about. Well, I started asking questions about it, and he stayed and and, and answered them. We he probably spent twenty or thirty minutes talking to me about nuclear throw weights for crying out loud, and his campaign staff was losing its mind because they were supposed to be in the air going to Augusta or something. And um, but you know. Five years later, I was in the Washington bureau covering Sam Nunn, and uh, and 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 we obviously knew him from that. But I I, I think he remembered me as well. So, and we had a, a little bit of a basis for that kind of politician reporter relationship. But it was you know I I can remember thinking I don't know why this guy is spending so much time talking to me about this, but it made a difference. Um, and actually, I'll um, one one story that I would occasionally tell in doing media training in my PR life, I uh, had to do with, with that and with David Gambrell, who was a, was Carter's appointee to the Senate when Russell died, mm -hmm. and was by all accounts a competent, capable, able member of the Senate, but he wasn't that much of a candidate or a politician. And, you know, he would come through Athens and one of the things that reporters would do back then is, you know, if you had a candidate coming through, we, we, we knew that Athens would be the third or fourth stop. So we would check the wire and see what the guys back in Rome and Gainesville had asked him about. And we'd ask the same thing just because it was easy. <laughs> and, and by the time he got that question for the third or fourth time, he was annoyed by it. <laughs> he wanted to talk about something else. Well, that annoyance would, would show. I mean, it was, you know, instead of, of, doing what Sam did and what Nunn did and, and uh, taking the time to answer the questions, Gambrell would, would get a little itchy about it. And, and, um, and, and I don't know that that colored the coverage or not, but it, I don't think it helped him. So anyway. But. So what, what was the transition like going from county courthouse, city hall to, to D.C.? I honestly don't remember it being that difficult. Um, obviously, bigger and more spread out, and but you know the the job that I had was primarily in covering the Georgia delegation, um, and if that was job A, job B was was covering the federal bureaucracies as they impacted the state. So there was a lot to do. And, uh, but, you know, you just sort of dug in and developed the relationships and, and figured out what was real news and, and what was smoke and, um, and, and 
did what you had to do. I, I honestly, if if you if you covered um, uh, several local governments, it's not that different from covering federal bureaucracies and and um, and the politics in 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 Congress. I, I, at least I did not find it to be that different. How big was the was the journal staff up in Washington back then? I was, um, or I guess maybe the Cox Media staff. Um, that's uh, um, you had multiple papers: Athens, Dayton, um, Austin, Palm Beach, uh, a couple of others, each of whom had their own reporter there. And um, and then you had two or three folks on a national staff, who were primarily responsible for the White House, mm-hmm. and um, and you know major national news out of Congress or whatever. Um, so I'd say probably a dozen people. Oh wow! Um, and now it's down to I I, I think one. Yeah. Um... Tia Mitchell, I believe. She just took over for yeah. Mar Hollerman. Who has, I understand, has moved down here. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah, but it was, you know, we were in a old offices up over a people's drugstore at 19th and Penn. <laughs> they, when I was up there some years later, and uh, somebody asked me to come by the bureau, and it had moved to fairly palatial um, um uh, setting several blocks away. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that lease has expired at this point. So <laughs> anyway. So did you cover, you said you covered the congressional delegation. Um, yeah, 1980 it, it was one of those pivotal years in Georgia politics. So as a Washington correspondent, were you covering Herman Talmadge during that campaign? Covered covered him as a senator and covered the campaign, mm-hmm. and I was uh, during that period transitioning back to Atlanta. I had uh, a number of reasons that I wanted to, to get back to Atlanta, and uh, had had asked to be transferred back, and so we were working on that. But during that period, I was covering, um, still covering the delegation and covering the the eighty campaign cycle, um, and was the. I, the lead journal reporter on the on that eighty Senate race, right? So, give me your impressions of of what Talmadge was facing going into the eighty campaign. So, you would have been up there for the real dark turn in, in right. his personal life and right. his political life, right? What did you witness? Did you notice a change in in Senator Talmadge? Yeah, it, when, when his son Bobby drowned, when, when the, the divorce came, the alcoholism as an issue, and then the ethics problems. What did you notice as somebody covering him? He, he was not um, that available to the daily press. So I, I wasn't interacting with him on, on that kind of a, on that regular a basis. But, it, but it, uh, his, his office... I, th- I think they absolutely um, grasped the, the seriousness and the significance of what was going on, and uh, and there was and they were worried about that press coverage. That press coverage was led by the Washington Star, a reporter named Ed Pound, I think his name was, um, and I. A lot of this has gotten cold on me over the years, but he was just he was breaking story after story and and we were typically following him um, uh, and uh, uh, and trying to develop different angles of our own but that it, it became clear that it was taking a huge political toll on Talmadge and the Talmadge organization and you know you you had various people talking openly about you know, challenging him going into the eighty Senate race, and 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 which was just unheard of. Right, that, so, that that there would be that discussion. Yeah, that that anybody would think about running against Herman Talmadge. Um, so, uh, and and he was 
clearly more deeply wounded by it than 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 people realized. I, um, uh, I covered that race through through the primary, and then I I left the paper before the general election. I figured the election, you know, it was primary was all that mattered, and um, uh, and then when he uh, when he lost, I was I was talking to some of his people afterwards, and and one of them told me uh, a pretty senior member of his staff said that they had polling data going into the end of it that showed him down a point to Mattingly, and they they tried to they pulled in all the big money types trying to raise enough money to get back on television and. Nobody took them seriously. They just, they didn't think that he had anything to worry about. But you know, then that was sort of the beginning of the transition. You're nodding like you've heard that story before. So um, yeah, it's he. Um, it, it was it was it was clearly a, a a moment in in Georgia politics. And Talmadge, I mean, you know, um, it, it's. It, it's it's worth thinking about what the state lost in terms of influence in Washington during that period. I mean, Talmadge, as a you know, there's no there's no uh, whitewashing his his record as a segregationist politician in the South and and his and his many transgressions uh, that you've alluded to, but he was a power. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was. As chairman of House Ag, um, Senate Ag, I'm sorry, uh, ranking member on Senate Finance, um, uh, he was uh, uh, on the Senate Watergate Committee at at the at the behest of Mike Mansfield, and he, um, I, I, my recollection is he tried to avoid that, you know, asked not to do it, and Mansfield said, "No, Herman, you know, we we hate you on it." <laughs> And if you've ever watched those Watergate tapes, um, Talmadge was actually a, a, an effective interrogator more than most of those guys are. So, uh, and so that was a ton of influence that the state lost when when he lost that race, um, and it rippled into that '82 governor's race. Um, you know, you not only lost Talmadge during that during that '80 Senate race, but Dawson Mathis, uh, the second district congressman, uh, decided to run mm -hmm. against him, and he lost. And that was that was also not an insignificant loss in terms of sort of a cumulative uh, influence that the state had back during it, that period. You, you phrase the way you phrased it. Talmadge lost the race. Do you fall down? Do you fall in, in the category of Herman Talmadge lost the race, or or Mac Mattingly won the race? Uh, boy, that's an interesting question, I, and I, I I can't say that I've thought a ton about that. I I, th I think I would, I, and it may be a a difference without a distinction, but um, I I think I would say that Talmadge lost that race. Um, you know, the the Republicans were clearly gaining ground during that period, but I think that you know a, an an undamaged Talmadge. Would have would have won re-election without a lot of trouble, to tell you the truth. Mm. So, you know that that's just my twenty twenty hindsight forty years right. later. So, so tell me why why did you decide to step away from journalism uh, and you joined was it Conan Wolf? Right, which at the time was you know the, uh, the one of maybe three or four PR firms in Atlanta and the largest and. Um, I, it, I, it, I, that, that's almost a separate interview. The, <laughs> the, the short version of that is that um, uh, the, the newspaper business had begun to lose its romance. <laughs> and and I, uh, I sort of woke up one morning and realized I had um, some kids I had to raise and, 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 um, and needed to get a, a real job or at least one that paid a little better. And and that was that that was sort of the primary 
uh, driver in that. Um, and Bob Cohn and I had, Bob had worked as the city editor in Augusta. Have you talked to, is he one of the folks you've interviewed? I, I have not, no. He'd probably be a good interview. He um, uh, was city editor in Augusta when I was a pup reporter in, in Athens, and we actually worked together on one story on the 10th Congressional District and the, the, uh, the Republican capacity for snatching defeat from the jaws of victory uh, back then. Um, but, uh, and he, uh, he called me one day at home. I had a day off and phone rang and I answered it and it was Cone with this gruff voice. And he said, well, have you had enough? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, your timing's pretty good. And so I, I made that jump. Uh, and that was in the fall of 80. What kind of work were you, were you doing, uh, once you got there? Oh, uh, it was it, it, all over the place. At one time, I had like ten or eleven active accounts, which was just insane. That's a lot. But <laughs> um, uh, a, a one that I remember uh, uh, probably working on the most, a couple of them, uh, the working on the what was I think called the? I can't remember what was the third or fourth runway project at at um, at, at the Atlanta airport. You know, helping to promote that, and then um, and wound up, uh, and I was only at Conan Wolf for a year before I hung out a little shingle of my own. But um, uh, did did um, a couple of sort of legislative assignments, working with clients uh, who had an interest in in legislation at the Capitol. So you you mentioned going into business for yourself. So you went you went independent and then were hired onto Bogin's campaign. How how did that how did that work? Um, was at Conan Wolf for a year, and then along with a friend I've mentioned, Cliff Green, he left the paper and we hung out a little shingle, primarily as freelance writers. Okay. But we began to pick up uh, more traditional sort of PR work as well, and and I was uh, because I had been the one of the lead political writers at the journal um, was approached by folks who were getting ready to run for governor in in eighty two and um, I had had an overture from the Harris campaign and I tell folks all you have to know about my political acumen is that I turned down Joe Frank and signed on with Bo and it's a little bit of an exaggeration it didn't get to an offer point with, with Joe Frank but you know, I I thought uh, I, I, like I think most other folks didn't think that Joe Frank would um, would have a that much of a chance against the field there, but mm -hmm. was obviously wrong. So, <laughs> so you mentioned David Norton earlier. Um, I was looking back through my notes. Uh, he wrote an article for Atlanta Magazine. He called he called the '82 campaign. This was the uh, the Democratic primary. Um, he, he, he called the, the, the end of the Southern Gothic election. And, and what do you think he meant by that? Is, is, is that, that it was just... Was uh, 82 boring compared to previous elections? It wasn't to me. <laughs> I was in the middle of it. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, did he not explain himself further in the article or... Because I, I I don't remember being aware of that. I'm sure I read it somewhere along the way. Right. Um, I think thinking back to it, and this is working off of memory, but but it was more where we were coming out. Of, Georgia was coming out of eight years uh, of George Busby. Um, this was obviously before Joe Frank had won, but gone were the 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 the, the shouters, the ranters, the ravers. This was a. a Politics by sort of executive, the, the sort of the, the businessman, government, um, and, and trying to you know chart the the transition of politics along with the transition of Georgia society and economics. The this was the the the, the Sun Belt era was was in full flower. Well, eighty two was a little rough, but you know. Well, I guess. Um... 
I, I would love to read that article and, and to I, think I about it. I will send it your way. Good, I because I, I would, I'm a, would, would love to think about what David was, <coughs> was, was, was saying there. That race, um, I, you know, you, you had on the, in the Democratic field, I think six or maybe seven candidates. Um, so Bo, had- Bogan, who I worked for, mm-hmm. um, Joe Frank Harris, Norman Underwood, Jack Watson, Billy Lovett, and Buck Melton. Buck Melton. Was there anybody Macon. else? Those yeah. were the serious. Yeah, that was a that was a pretty impressive field. And you know, one of the questions that I still get occasionally is, you know, how did Bo lose that race? Well, that that's a that's a, a long, long conversation. <laughs> but but part of part of it goes back to what I said a few minutes ago, that 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 the effects of the 80 Senate race rippled into that 82 governor's race. Um, Bo had been viewed as a likely 82 gubernatorial candidate um, for a while. As a matter of fact, when I was still at the paper, I did a story um, previewing likely candidates for the 82 Senate governor's mm-hmm. race and mentioned and referenced Bo as one of the, the likely contenders. But um, uh, he initially took himself out of that race. There was, um, because the state had lost Talmadge, because the state had lost Mathis in Washington, Bo was the, he was the dean of the House delegation. And, um, well, is that true? He was, he was certainly one of the senior members of the House delegation. And, um, and a lot of people in the business community um, around the state leaned on him to stay in Congress and not to come back and run for governor um, uh, because you know he was chairman of the military construction um, subcommittee on house appropriations um, uh, and had had real influence and that that would have been that was going to be a loss and so he initially said I'm not going to run for governor well that created a vacuum that that several candidates, including Joe Frank, began to step into, mm-hmm. um, and um, uh, and made all the difference in the world. Norman Underwood was uh, coming out of a, a a respectable showing in that eighty Senate race, um, and and made one of the great media buys in the history of Georgia politics that year. He was this this, this was eighty two, and Norman for reasons nobody could understand at the time, bought the early, um, the Braves early in that season from day one. They went 13-0. and 0. That, that was the, the year that they won the World Series and, and got off to a 13-0 and 0 stop, start, and their ratings went up, and Norman's poll numbers were just rising along with uh, the Braves' 13-0 and 0 standing. Um, so... Um, that was, uh, and, and, and he rode that to an early lead in that race uh, and held that for um, a while anyway. Um, and, um, but, and, and, but I think that, that, that you, you did see Metro Atlanta come into real prominence in that campaign, arguably in a way that you might not have before. You still had the urban rural split. You still had the the North Georgia South Georgia split. Sure. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I was I mean I was the, the press secretary, and this was during I guess this was during the runoff. It would have had to have been. Um, I got a call one day from a from a um, uh, one of the campaign's field people up in who's working in North Georgia, and uh, it was. A, uh, then a young woman, she said she was just screaming. She said, did we put this ad out? There's, there's this ad that's showing up all over North Georgia, these flyers that say it's North versus South. A vote for Bogan is a vote for South Georgia. And I said, I have, I, what are you talking about? I've never heard of this. And, uh, and she filled me in and Somehow I managed to get a copy there in the office, and it was this ad that had run in, as I recall, the Nichols, Georgia Observer, 
it took me probably most of the afternoon to figure out where Nichols, Georgia was and to, and to get a phone number for them and to call them. And I talked to the, I think I talked to the publisher or the editor and, and, or somebody, and they said, yeah, your campaign manager came in and placed that ad here. And, you know, the circulation was maybe a couple of thousand people that that, that paper went to. But one of Harris's people got a hold of it and very wisely sent it to the their counterparts in North Georgia, and they papered the north end of the state with that ad. So, you know, that, that you know, was that decisive? No, but it was, but it didn't help. <laughs> but uh, anyway. So, so what were the, the, the sort of key reasons for why Joe Frank comes from sort of a, it's hard to call Tom Murphy's candidate a dark horse, but. Uh, he but. he was early on. I think um, my, we referenced Rick Allen a couple of times. My ref, My recollection is that he had a column at some point in that race that referred to Joe Frank as a flat brainwave in the polls and down like at two percent or something. Uh, I, a number of factors. Um, uh, he, um, I, again, I think that that Joe Frank was one of those candidates who stepped into the vacuum that that Bo left when he took himself out, and then he had to fight his way back in. Um, there were other good candidates in that race that we had to battle through early on. Um, uh, it was Bo and Norman. Norman was leading and Bo was running second um, in the handful of polls that you saw. You didn't have money to do the, the kind of daily polling that, right. that you have in campaigns now. But um, uh, it was, you know, Norman was leading for the most part. I think we had a poll, if I recall correctly, in June of 82 that we both squeaked past Norman for the first time. And, um, and you know, Jack Watson was a, was a contender. He had had a constituency. Uh, I always thought Buck Melton was a very impressive guy and was surprised he didn't do better than he did, to tell you the truth. But... Um, uh, but because Bo and Norman were at the top of the pile for most of the race, uh, we were beating each other up, and were and and we were pretty bruised up by the time we got to the runoff. And Joe Frank had not taken many blows. He was not, you know, he had had not taken much negative damage at all. So I think that that was a factor, and they ran a smart race. Um, Joe, uh, they were. Uh, and in some respects, the, the Harris campaign, I think, was a sort of an early precursor of what became the Tea Party. Um, they ran a very, you know, they, uh, early in that race, um, there was uh, almost tacit agreement, there was tacit agreement, and there may have been even more than that. All of the major candidates, including Harris, would not say absolutely no to the idea of a 1% sales tax. Most people back then could look at the way the state was growing and what, what it was going to need and know that there was a need for more revenue, for education, and for a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the sort of the responsible thing that, that, that Bo and Norman and uh, Jack Watson and the others did was they danced around that and did not say no. And, and Harris did the same thing early on. Well, Harris turned around, took the no tax pledge, um, really began to beat on Bo as for his record in Congress as a as a big spender. I remember they had a um, uh, something they did with with a with a credit card. Bo, a congressional credit card. I've forgotten exactly how they executed it, but it was, it was effective. And so all of a sudden, Bo became the the big spender. And you know, never mind that that the the bacon he had bought brought home for Georgia, including Marta, including the airport, um, uh, and Kings Bay and Fletsy and everything else. Um, they they turned that on its head and did a very effective job with it. So I think. Um, it, it, as is usually the case, there were um, a number of factors that played into that. 
Um, and uh, as as we were getting close to the initial general uh, primary, um, it, it became clear that Joe Frank had caught a little bit of fire. I remember our pollster was Peter Hart, uh, who at the time was one of the, um, I guess he was still coming up, but he was already a pretty prominent Democratic Party pollster. <clears throat> and um, I think we did two, maybe three polls. And the, the one in June um, showed some life on Harris's part, June of 82, showed some life on Harris's part. And, um, uh, and Hart said he's, he's beginning to consolidate the the very conservative part of the Democratic Party, the religious vote, right, and all of that. He said, but I don't see how you can put together enough for a majority. And I was sitting there and I thought, man, I really wish he hadn't have said that. It was almost like a jinx. But um, and the other thing that happened in, in the run up to the primary that, that I remember, um, uh, the woman who was our scheduler had worked in the Capitol for a long time. And um, and knew the state politics really well, and and it's when it looked like Joe Frank might sneak into that runoff, uh, she, I remember her saying, "I do not want to run against the House of Representatives," which is what you were going to have to do, and um, and that that remark to me was 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 prescient. Uh, the Senate was largely for Bo, but the House was a different creature, mm -hmm. and with 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 uh, Speaker Murphy. Um, driving that that herd, it was a it was a force to contend with. Right. So, I, and that's sort of a rambling reaction to or answer to the question. But uh, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think at least part of it's probably right. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, and that that was your only campaign that you worked on directly. I suppose. Uh, I, 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 and. Lesser involvement with a couple of others over time, but none really worth talking a lot about. Um, uh, I usually just sort of pulled in in, a, in an advisory capacity to help one candidate or another, but right. not a lot since then. So from the Ginn campaign, you went to Bell South? Yep. Or was there... A, 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 it... it when you lose a governor's race in Georgia, you pay a price for it. It took me a while to find a job. I actually worked briefly at, at CNS um, and uh, and then was approached by a headhunter. Um, uh, the, they were looking for a speechwriter for a new company in Atlanta and um, turned out to be, this was right on the eve of the breakup of the Bell system. Right. And um, I... I wound up deciding to go ahead and do that and worked at Bell South for 10 years. So what kind of work were you doing at Bell South? Just communications, public relations? Was was originally hired in as the as the speechwriter for the chairman and CEO, okay. a guy named John Clendenin. Did that for a couple of years, and they, um, they promoted me and, and gave me media relations. To manage, in addition to being a speechwriter, which is which is a prescription for driving your liquor bill off the scale, <laughs> um, and I uh, eventually got somebody in to backstop me on the speechwriting. Um, but uh, those were sort of the first two. Um, uh, over the course of the decade, I uh, managed several other communications functions at Bell South, including internal comms. Um, uh, oversaw the, the communications planning uh, function for um, uh, for corporate for a time, uh, and and managed uh, what we called what did we call it sort of stakeholder engagement uh, processes. So it was it was uh, it was I, I thoroughly enjoyed the time there. It was a great experience and and um, and a uh, and uh, a. Uh, a slice of experience I'm glad I had. So after that comes uh, Hazlett Sorrell? Yep, well, um, went to, um, was recruited from the from Bell South to um, 
until Fleischman Hillard and was there for about a year and um, um, and decided that I, well, it was time to hang out another shingle uh, and did that with a, a couple of others and um, it was originally Hazlett, Sorrell and Lane and and over time the uh, Lane and Sorrell um, went different ways. So what kind of, was this going back to, to different accounts? Were you, was this public relations and public affairs? Or was this communications? It was or? really broad spectrum. Um, and most of the work that I did and attracted was tended to be sort of public policy oriented and public affairs oriented. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, crisis sorts of stuff, problems. Um, I didn't do a ton of of traditional marketing or brand management or those sorts of things. Um, uh, and um, but but did do a lot of work that that kept me at the Capitol on primarily on health policy and transportation and um, um, and some other issues like that, education. So when when did that when did you go from from Hazlett Sorrell to Hazlett Group? When 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 did that transition happen? Probably about fifteen years in. So right around two thousand ish, give or take. No, it would have been we opened we started the firm. Well, I guess that would have been oh nine then if it was yeah that something late. like that something okay. like that. So while you were there. 2002, the 2002 election. Yeah. Governor Barnes versus Senator, State Senator Purdue. Right. What was your expectations going into that that campaign? Well, going in, I think that, you know, like everybody else, I figured that that Roy Barnes would would win re-election fairly easily. I mean, he had um, you know, there it, it, I don't think anybody thought that that Purdue could put up the kind of fight that he obviously did, but that did begin to change fairly early, um, and um, and and some of this is hindsight, but you could see see a, a good bit of it at the time, mm. um, and and you had Barnes had several vulnerabilities that were pretty obvious. I mean, the flag, uh, the Northern Arc, mm -hmm. he had teacher tenure. Um, I can't remember, recall exactly what it was now, but he had done something to annoy the courthouse crowd. Tort, uh, well, counties, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and it seems like there was a fifth issue and, um, and, and, they, and everything he did, I think, was, was probably worthwhile and the right public policy thing to do. Um, but he paid a price for each one of them, and I sometimes have wondered if you could just pull one of those off the table, would it have would it have made the difference? I, I don't know. I, I think it, the flag absolutely would have made the difference. But um, he, yeah, I've talked with him about this. He knew when he did that, you know, that that was uh, uh, the the risk that he was running. Oh yeah. Um, and I was, and they their strategy clearly was. You know we can we can raise enough money to build a firewall to hold off any kind of significant right. Republican challenge, and and they you know they raised what twenty some odd million dollars or twenty million dollars, and I've forgotten what Purdue got, but um, but it was a fraction and obviously a fairly small fraction of that, but um, there was I mean I can remember being at some meeting some fundraiser. Um, and people who were given to Barnes, but weren't happy about it. I mean, they they were really feeling that their arms were being twisted. And and I um, and I said to somebody, I said, you know, everybody in this room has given Barnes money, but I wonder how many of them are going to vote for him. And the guy I was with said, you know, this is one who won't. You <laughs> know, but. But uh, uh, in any event, uh, and, and I, I was doing a lot of work out in rural Georgia and in South Georgia at the time, and I was uh, remember coming back up um, 
out of, out of Albany. I think I was coming through Lee County one afternoon, um, and there was a telephone pole with it. it had two signs on it. One of them, top one said, um, love Jesus, and the one under that said, boot barns. And I thought, man, that's just about all you got to know about this end of the state. And, and that was close. You know, that was close. Uh, and I can remember um, uh, toward the end of that race being in a meeting with a client board uh, and uh, talking about the governor's race. And I said, I'm, I'm not ready to predict the Barnes upset yet, but something's going on out there. And it's, you know, it, it, it feels different. Um, so, um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know that anybody really saw that coming. I want, I don't, I, and I wasn't close to the Peru people at all. I don't know whether they saw it coming. So. Well, what did that, what did that, the fallout from that election mean at the court at, at excuse me, at the Capitol with, with, with the, with the, the lobbyists and the consultants and the, the, the establishment? Oh, it, it turned everything upside down. I mean, all of a sudden you had, uh, uh, lobbyists who had toiled in the, on the, in the Republican vineyard who were on top of the world and were calling the shots and all that sort of thing. And you had you know, organizations that had typically traditionally not had much to do with them or had a need for them that were hiring them. And so it was, you know, it was, there was, it was a, a change in the world order. So you, we were talking about how much money that, that, that Governor Barnes and Bobby Kahn had raised for that, 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 that his reelection. And a lot of it came from Lobbyists, lawyers from the, the the business establishment, the the big businesses, the banks downtown right. Atlanta, uh, are are these are, are those institutions, those companies, are they still drivers of, of politics and public policy in Georgia? Um, I'm so uh, you know I'm far enough into retirement that I don't know that I'm qualified to give you. Uh, an answer to that. I'm sort of disconnected from a lot of that, but, but, but money still has a loud voice, and I'm, you know, I'm, um, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if if um, the folks in office wouldn't return a phone call from Delta Airlines or Coca-Cola or or wherever. So it's it, the business community's gotten bigger and more diverse, mm. but. Um, uh, and, and and more focused in some respects on national affairs, right? But but yeah, I'm sure they still pay attention to what's going on. Why do you think, or, or or how were Republicans able to consolidate power so quickly um, after 2002? You know, you, you think Rufus Bullock was elected governor of Georgia back in 1868. He was ran out of office in 1870, and it was a Democratic state up until 2002. Um, by 2005, Governor's Mansion, House, and Senate. And then by 2010, every statewide elected official. I think that there are better people to answer that question than me. But um, uh, part of the answer was, I think, is that, that the Republicans had been working in an organized sort of way for a long time. You know, I, going back to the, my time in Athens, uh, there were no Republicans in local office. I mean, there, it's, there were just almost no Republicans, period. But there was a, there was sort of a little uh, Republican party there. Um, and there were, the chairman was a guy who, uh, I think his name was Jack Curtis. He was. He had a local gravel company, as I recall. A small businessman, a nice guy, happy warrior, <laughs> and you know I would, as a, the local Daily News reporter, would bump into him from time to time. He always invited me to come to their meetings, and I, I may have gone to one or two. I don't recall that I ever wrote anything about it. It was, you know, there wasn't. It, it, it they just didn't matter. <laughs> but but they were. They were recruiting people and 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 training candidates and thinking about 
they were playing a, a pretty long game. Um, and I saw that when I got to DeKalb County, where they were obviously farther along, further along, um, and you had people who were getting ready to run for the legislature, uh, John Linder, I can remember, and, and Bob Bell and, and, uh, and some others, um, who were impressive people. I mean, they were, they were serious candidates. And so they had just worked it and worked it and worked it. And when they finally flipped it, I, I, and I think that you know, part of this is that they had some, some management support and expertise nationally as well. And so whether it was all done locally or, uh, or whether they were getting good guidance on, okay, let's, you know, you, you're, you're this close to the majorities that you need Let's go roll three or four or five senators and House members, and you know they had to. They, I think they had Terry Coleman and the Democrats held the House for the first two years of the Purdue That's administration. Right. That's right. But by then, that Democratic caucus in the House was crumbling, and uh, and I and as I recall, they immediately rolled the Senate. They got, yeah. Um, they they got Jack Hill, uh, Rooney Bowen. And Mickey Chanel did Mickey flip immediately or was he not? Like, I don't I don't believe immediately. Um, it's Don Cheeks maybe maybe from up yeah. in Rome. Yeah, that that's possible. Yeah. So, um, and and you could see you know the the state had been been going more and more Republican nationally. Right. So you know the the guys who were flipping could see the handwriting on the wall and. And it was a way to retain some power and some influence and to be able to to do what they needed to do. Well, I guess on the flip side uh, of that question is how Democrats were able to hold on to power so long. As you said, that, 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 that sort of, there was that, um, that sort of riptide at the national level. Right. Sort of the, the nationalizing of the, of the, Democratic Party, or you know, the, the 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 lessening of distinctions between Georgia Democrats and National Democrats. But how were how were Democrats here at the Gold Dome the Legislature, Governor's Mansion, able to hold on to power and sort of buck those trends in the '60s and then in in, in the '80s with the Reagan Revolution, um, or even Zell Miller in '94, who came close to losing. But, yeah, but. We're still able to hold power. Yeah, the um, Georgia was the last of the southern states to flip, um, and my theory on that was that at least part of it was that Carter's presence here as the the only Democrat to come out of the of the old South um, as president had slowed down or masked that re rising Republican influence. I have zero data to back that up. It's just, you know, the, the, uh, the state went for him in 80 against Reagan, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and, and that was sort of that nationally. Um, uh, and, and, and the Democratic Party was never all that well organized, for crying out loud. Very true. So, you know, it was just Jackson uh, J. Jenner dinner here and a Herman Talmadge birthday party there. That was it. You know, that was it. that was sort of it. So, you know, you had, um, uh, but I, 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 I don't have a, a good answer for that or an explanation beyond, you know, just the the sort of the afterglow of Carter giving them some a little more running room, and you had the. Um, the rising influence of Metro Atlanta. Right. Um, but the truth of the matter is, Metro Atlanta was the sort of the spa, early spawning ground for Republicans. I mean, if you if you if you look at the maps of where Republicans got their votes back then versus where they get them now, Metro Atlanta was where they you know that's where it started. That's where Mac Mattingly's yeah margin came from. Right. Almost entirely. Yeah. Exactly. So. Um, uh, it, that I mean th that would make a good uh, uh, 
thesis or dissertation for for one of your successors. Yeah. So. <laughs> I've been there, done that. You've, you've done that. <laughs> so, so tell me, we're now uh, 17 years past the, the Republican takeover uh, of the governor's mansion here in Georgia. Um, three, you know, Governor Purdue, Governor Deal, and now Governor Kemp. Um, where are the, the, are the governing um, priorities of Republicans and Democrats similar? Where are they different? Um, oh, boy. I, I, you know, I, that probably sort of breaks in, a, in some ways that are similar on a, a national level. I mean, the, the, uh, the health care debate um, uh, and and for the life of me, I I don't understand why the why the Republicans cannot bring themselves to to deal realistically with the uh, with the the health care challenges in the state and what what um, uh, Medicare Medicaid Medicaid expansion would mean for the state and for the rural areas that are now their base. So um, uh, there's that. I, I think that um, uh, I will the the, uh, the the first two Republican governors, of course, were were Democratic converts. We're now on the first born and bred Republican governor, and it's going to be interesting to see how he differs and departs from his predecessors. I don't know the answer to that question. He's been a, he's been more he's been shrewder and, and savvier than I expected to tell you the truth in some in some respects. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether he can 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 uh, hold back the, the demographic shift that Democrats think are going to pave their way back into the governor's office. Uh, and that should, but I don't know that that's a guaranteed thing at all. But, um, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm doing a good job of answering that question. Um, I, I, as the urban-rural split becomes into starker and starker relief, um, I think that those issues will as well. I mean, health care is, um, is one. I, I, I think that you're going to see uh, some real dialogue around, real debate around, around gun safety issues, mm. um, and uh, and uh, and and revenue and and um, uh, how the you know how the the taxes that are raised primarily here in Atlanta wind up getting spent all over the state, and it's it's going to be. It's going to be interesting to see what happens as the as the legislature following the next census and reapportionment becomes increasingly Metro Atlanta centric. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I'm I'm sort of rambling on you there. No, I don't no, know. no, no. It, that, that, that's a good segue in, in, into the next questions, which which are you know similarly uh, very similar. That that why have Dem- Democrats not been able to make or mount some sort of a comeback, but at the same time, what's the biggest danger facing the Republican Party uh, as it tries to maintain its grip on, on political power in the state? Well, the the first part of that, I think, uh, and, you know, why have Democrats not been able to do better in terms of making a comeback? They're still pretty disorganized, you know, <laughs> just are, and um, and they can't. You know they they are, are haven't been able to decide how to run. I mean, um, four years ago, Carter and Nunn, Jason and Michelle, uh, really ran as Republicans light, um, and they were they were running campaigns that a um, uh, a friend of mine at the paper who since passed away, a reporter named. Prentice Palmer used to call fuzzing it up the middle, and uh, which was the way Sam Nunn and George Busby and 
even Jimmy Carter and others ran back then because it was it was it 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 worked. I mean, the state was fairly moderate um, and uh, pragmatic and not overly ideological and all those sorts of things. So that worked back then, and uh, and they you know they tried that. Um, uh, what was it? 20, 2014, 2014, I mean, 2014. Would, would, would have been Nunn Carter. Yeah, and um, and it fell flat. I mean, there were polls showing them close and leading, and and they just weren't there. Mm -hmm. Stacey Abrams ran as an unapologetic progressive, and um, and and got a lot closer, obviously, than anybody has before, and I think it sort of settled that debate at least for the time being you know if you're going to be a democrat go ahead and be a democrat in georgia mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to see how that sort of plays out the other piece of it what can the republicans do to hold that back they are and this sort of gets to some of the work that i've done on some of the my trouble in, in god's country research and looking at the the politics of that split you've got um, uh, in, in rural Georgia, you've got uh, two counties that went 90% for Brian Kemp, and I've forgotten how many that were well in that were in in the 80s. Oh sure, yeah. You know, um, and um, uh, but those are small, dying rural counties. Right. So the question they've got is, how do they replace those votes? And the answer, I think, is in the the northern exurbs, mm -hmm. primarily the Cherokees and and Dawsons and, and Forsyth, other, Forsyth, and Bartow. Yeah, but um, but they are but they won't have quite the claim on those counties and those votes that they have had in South Georgia. The difference is, you've got higher education levels in those counties up there, and as those education levels rise. You know, the Forsyth County and Cherokee County are not in any danger of going Democrat anytime soon, mm -hmm. but they're going to be a little less Republican than they were um, as as you get a, a better educated, more professional um, uh, population. Right. right. There. And so, you know, can they can they make those numbers work? I don't know. The other thing that the, that the Republicans d did this last time around that was really effective. Uh, was that they got a better turnout for all of the uh, hype and and hoopla around the Democratic efforts to drive their voters to the polls, especially well, everywhere, but especially in rural Georgia, the Republicans got a better turnout. They got about 71%. They got about a 2% better turnout in most counties than, than the Democrats did. Uh, or the counties that they won versus the counties the Democrats won, and um, you know I, uh, I, I I I did a blog post on that after the election, and heard from a, a guy in um, in one of those rural counties who said I had gotten that exactly right that they in fact they had an operation it was Red Firewall or something mm -hmm. like that um, that that they were run into. You know, I, I didn't ask him, but, you know, they, they may have been dragging him out of the graveyards. So. <laughs> but, but uh, which has happened in Georgia. I shouldn't say that. It's, uh, I, I don't mean to. to uh, uh, well, back in 46, they voted in alphabetical order, too. They did. That and, was 46. Well, and, and they, uh, in uh, as late as jimmy carter's run for the state senate they did it down Six, in 62 yeah. yeah so uh so it's a it's a proud tradition <laughs> well it's a tradition i don't know if it's you know, <laughs> it, ignominious so, tradition. anyway but th i think that they've got they're they're racing the clock those those small rural counties in middle and south georgia um uh, i mean they're literally more people dying than being born the people that are that can get out are getting out, um, and uh, and the return on investment now there is gonna is gonna dry up. Can they replace that with a vote in in the northern exurbs? Maybe I think it's it's I think it's a foot race. Mm -hmm. So 
anyway. What What do you think the effect? And this this is uh, probably an, another discussion entirely. But what has the the short and long term effect of of a Donald Trump presidency been on the politics in Georgia? Boy. Um, that is a whole longer conversation, <laughs> I think. Well, you've you've you have seen, you know, Trump has has remade the Republican Party in his own image. It is, I think, can fairly be described as, and I'm, and, and uh, I'm, I'm not a Trump guy at all. I'm, 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 I'm I have almost nothing good to say about him, but he um, he has co-opted the Republican Party um, and made it his own. And, um, uh, and the, although the interesting thing is, Brian Kemp did even better than Donald Trump did. In that most, is correct. In just about every county that, that the Republicans won. Uh, and uh, and Kemp, Kemp's defiance of Trump to appoint uh, Kelly Leffler to the Senate was really interesting. I didn't think he had a choice. I didn't think, especially once Trump demanded um, that he or urged him to appoint Collins and basically demanded it. <coughs> I didn't see how he could do how he could do that. Um, I, I, I did a Facebook post and I said he might as well um, hold a press conference on the Capitol steps the day afterwards and and castrate himself with a chainsaw. Because he, um, <clears throat> he, he will have he will have neutered himself politically. He had to stand up to Trump, or he would have been, I think, politically finished at the Capitol. Um, so uh, he uh, and and I think he he strengthened himself. He probably helped the party in terms of of reclaiming some of that lost suburban support with that. Um, and and it'll be interesting to see how all that plays out. Mm -hmm. So do you, what do you think the influence... Uh, 2018, the, the Republican primary, again, you know, conventional wisdom said Casey Cagle was going to win the Republican nomination and you know, go on to, to, to win the governorship. Why and how was Brian Kemp able to not, not just make it into the runoff, but then win it really pulling away? Um, I think he won 100 and, what was it, 57 it counties? It was insane. You know, it, it, was, it was over 15 minutes after the polls closed. Yeah, it was, um, it was, it was, and I wasn't in, in, involved in anybody's campaign in mm -hmm. that, that year and did not... Um, and wasn't following, you know, I, I think I figured that Cagle would win it. Uh, the, the people who were much closer to that, which is just about anybody, than I was said that, that told me that Cagle's numbers just fell off a cliff right after the tweet from Trump, that they just, just cratered. And which tells you a lot about, you know, all you have to know about Trump's influence in the state, so uh, and and which I'm sure gave Kemp some pause, you know, in when he was when he was doing what he had to do with with Leffler, but uh, but I, I think that uh, I, I've I've retired my crystal ball where Trump is concerned, but um, I, I I I don't think that he is gaining any ground, uh, and in fact. Um, uh, it's it's hard to say that he's lost much because his supporters are you know you won't move them with sticks of dynamite, but um, it, it's it, it does seem to me that that he's that he has not gained any ground and he hadn't helped himself even in, in Georgia very much. So you mentioned with the sort of you know maybe political triangulation with with the appointment of of Kelly Leffler to to reach out to to especially you know, the, the suburban white college-educated women that, that we've heard so much about from pundits and political scientists that are really going to be the, the, the key swing group in, in what is an increasingly a swing state in Georgia. 
Um, yeah, and that, that maybe that's a play um, by Republicans and by, by Governor Kemp. Is there a similar play for rural and small town voters that Democrats uh, can, can, can tout? I mean, they have very little power to influence policy um, under, under the gold dome. But is there a way they can reach out to rural Georgia, small town Georgia, God's country, as you would say? Um, I'm skeptical that there's much, that there's much gold in them there, flatlands. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, again, you know, you, you've got such a, such small populations, they are shrinking, they are overwhelmingly red. Mm-hmm. Um, part of the, of, of the Abram strategy was to do that, was to, was to drive up, um, um, minority registration in those counties and get those folks to the polls. Uh, I don't, you know, it's just hard to imagine that that's, that anybody else could try to replicate that. And if she didn't do any better with it than she did, you know, it's, um, I, 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 I would, I would invest they, elsewhere. They'd be diminishing returns essentially Ab- to, to, yeah. to spread it out over, especially south of, you know, south of the Nat line, that's, yeah. that's a lot of territory to cover. And yeah, Teresa Tomlinson, who I like a lot, is running for the Senate against David Perdue this time around, and, and uh, she said sometime recently that uh, that she was going to pursue a, 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 a rural, the rural vote and, and spend time campaigning. And I thought, man, I you know I wish her well, but I don't know that that's a good use of, of finite resources. In, in this campaign, um, so I, have, have you ever read a book by Bill Bishop, a guy, um, The Big Sort? Yeah. How about this? I I haven't read it cover to cover. The the premise being that essentially Democrats, Republicans, liberals, and conservatives want to live, breathe, and consort with people like themselves. Right. You've got um, uh, that. That's 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 close enough. It, that, that that over time the the country has been sorting itself into like-minded communities. It's not for nothing that this area we're in is called the People's Republic of Decatur. So, and Athens probably has a similar name. But so yeah, you've got um, uh, it, it, you've you've got those sorts of of, of uh, that sort of sorting that's going on, and. I don't know how you how you overcome that in a Glasscock County or a or a Brantley County or one of those 80 75 percent counties um, um, south of the Nat line. Mm-hmm. I just don't. I mean, Towns County, Georgia, where Zell was from, gave him was the county where he did best in his first governor's race. Sure, got 73 percent of the vote or about that uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. Kemp got over eighty percent of the town's county vote, um, so you've got that kind of switch, but you've also got that concentration, and it's just, you know, it's it's going to take decades, I think, to to reverse that. So I think we are sort of inevitably driven into these into these polarized sorts of of communities, and it's going to make finding solutions to all these problems, especially the urban-rural split problems, all that much more difficult. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what the solutions are. So, but, um, um, well, let me, I'll pause there. So, Well, you know, Stacey Abrams in, in 2018 obviously was riding a, a, a blue wave nationally, sort of, you know, Historically, president the presidential party right. suffers uh, in, in the midterms. Um, do you think that that her performance and, and essentially uh, the Democratic performance there wasn't too much deviation from top of the ticket down to the, down to the bottom? Uh, that the Democratic performance means that going forward, 2020, 2022, 2024 that Georgia is a legitimate swing state, that we, 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 that this state, we here in Georgia are gonna go the way of the Ohio's and the, the Florida's and the, and the, the 
I think it's it, I Arizona's think it, anymore. Yeah, I, I think it's becoming more and more so. Mm-hmm. I mean, every cycle there are polls showing the Democrat within striking distance or with a minor lead or whatever, and then and that collapses by election day. So it's Lucy with the football. It's Lucy with the football. So I, you know, I uh, I'm I'm reluctant based on all that to predict. A, that it's going to happen, or B, when it's going to happen. I, I think, um, you know, again, the Republicans um, got to power playing a long game and working hard and with a lot of organization and and doing a good job of recruiting and training candidates uh, and supporting them. And, the, you know, the, the, the Democrats, meanwhile, still aren't organized as far as I'm concerned and can see. So, um, and I think that, that that matters. I think that the Republicans have been more disciplined. Um, they have been more focused on job one, which is winning. Um, and, <coughs> and and the Democrats have are still playing catch up there. Now, I think Stacey Abrams ran an admirable race. I think it was a well-organized race, and I think that she has has done a, um, frankly, a, 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 a marvelous job of managing a political loss. I mean, she's kept herself relevant and, mm-hmm. and has continued to, to fight the good fight in courts, in the courts, and has, and has uh, made some headway with that. So, you know, there's, you know, she's, she's still the, the spark and the driver for for the Democrats, and I, it'll be interesting to see if she can sustain that, and whether she runs again, which I think most people expect that she will, or you know, um, puts her weight behind somebody else. I don't see anybody else stepping up right now. Well, there's the you know, there's there's not a, an insignificant chance that she ends up as the number two on on whoever wins the Democratic presidential nomination, which which is a, a, astounding for somebody who. Who lost. lost the statewide race in Georgia? Right. That's kind of my reaction to that. I think that um, um, uh, she, I thought her, uh, and I'm glad she didn't run for president. I thought she showed good judgment in not doing that. I thought she showed judge, good judgment in not um, committing to, to to serve as as Biden's vice president. There was some early talk about yes, that, yeah. and. Um, uh, but she could have roiled the the southern primaries if she had gotten in. She absolutely could have changed everything right. if she had gotten in as a as a sort of a native daughter um, candidate uh, on the Democratic side. But um, that's a good point. Jo- yeah. Joe Biden's numbers would have taken a significant hit. Probably. Yeah, it, it would have been that. That would have been interesting to to see what what kind of damage it did to him. I think, you know, it's the the it's going to be interesting to see how the Democrats handle all this. If um, you know, they they can fight it out during the primary over health care and and um, uh, income disparity and. Uh, inequality and and, um, uh, and all of those issues, gun safety and everything else. But when they get to the general election, the only issue is Donald Trump. And, you know, it, 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 nothing else is going to matter. I, I think that that's one thing that the Biden campaign had right from the get-go is we got to beat this guy and I'm the one who can do it. I don't know whether he can or not. But, um, uh, but, if 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 they're out there talking about anything except what a repre- reprehensible human being Donald Trump is, then I'm sorry, they're, they're, he's probably going to beat them. So, <laughs> so we're, we're we're looking ahead. As you know, you've you sort of given us your your crystal ball gazing and, and everything, but looking ahead at the, the the divergence of rural and urban Georgia um, you, know, you, you mentioned briefly um, reapportionment what kind of effect I mean we, we can probably 
guess what those numbers are going to look like pretty closely, uh, or, or rather precisely. What does that mean in terms of policy, whether Democrats or Republicans are in charge here in Georgia? It's, um, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that question. It's one of the things I've thought a lot about as part of my trouble in God's country research and, and analysis. Um, I do think that one of the changes that we've seen in the state over the past X number of decades is that, you know, it used to be that that there was some synergy between the urban and rural areas, mm-hmm. um, and that there was a some sense of of common purpose that you found at the legislature. I I think we're in a period where the folks in Metro Atlanta don't know as much about rural Georgia and vice versa uh, as they used to. And I think that we're we're uh, approaching, if not already in a period, where legislators in Atlanta and Marietta and Lawrenceville and Cumming and elsewhere are going to start waking up and saying, tell me again why I should care what happens in Tifton or Baxley or... Um, Ailey, Georgia, and um, uh, and why my why my taxpayers' dollars are being used to subsidize um, problems in those parts of the state, and and I don't know how the even if if the Republican Party retains those suburban legislative seats, which are some of which are falling to the Democrats now. Um, I don't know that they're going to have that much common cause with with rural Republicans in South mm-hmm. Georgia and, and rural Middle Georgia. I, th- I think that's the great question: is whether or not uh, the republic, whether or not the Republicans can do a better job of holding together that kind of a fractious caucus than the Democrats did in, the, in their closing days. Right. And I think that's why we all have to stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've mentioned your blog uh, several times, but what was the what was the impetus for that? What was what was the inspiration for you to to, to take that up? Uh, um, a couple of uh, there are different sets of roots to it. Um, some, some old and some new. The most immediate, the newest, go back to um, um, a a public affairs campaign that my PR firm ran going starting a decade ago now um, uh, around the issue of public health. Mm-hmm. We were funded by Healthcare Georgia Foundation. We were, um, uh, the, they were concerned about the state of the, sta- of, the, of the state's public health agencies, the public health department, not the, hosp- not the medical delivery system that like most the people- ca- the county health, health County health departments and the state department yeah. of public health and which had really fallen into into a, a bad bureaucratic despair uh, or state, and um, uh, and and there were a, a lot of needs to try to rehabilitate it. Our task was to organize a, uh, an awareness and education campaign to begin to lay the groundwork for legislation to to uh, to address some of those problems optimally by. Uh, breaking it out of the department at the time, it was a, a division of the Department of Community Health, I think it was, and standing it up as a standalone um, department. And for reasons that would take way too long to explain, <laughs> we wound up settling on a messaging strategy that that looked at uh, that demonstrated the relationship between population health and economic vitality at a community level. And as we got into the research on that, I, I had a pretty good idea of what we would find, but I was still sort of stunned at the um, uh, at just how dramatic it was. And you know, one of the things that we did was 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 drive drive both of those notions to a bottom line, and um, and looked at at um, uh, productivity and healthcare costs in in counties that tie it to their to their economic status and to their population health status 
uh, one factoid that we developed um, uh, every year as the campaign ran for about four years. And um, we developed what we called the, uh, the campaign was called the Partner Up for Public Health Campaign. And we developed these annual power ratings that were a combination of the rankings that counties had for economics and county and rankings that they had for health from independent sources. And, um, and one year, the, I think the last year we did it, um, the number one county in the state was Oconee County. It was, Makes sense. Was, I think it was first for health and second for economics or the other way around, but it, overall it was the top county in the state. At the very bottom, we had a tie between Crisp and Wilcox counties, side by side neighbors in deep south Georgia, south central Georgia, um, and we looked at their at all the metrics. But the, the the bottom line that we drove it to was taxes paid and uh, and Medicaid dollars consumed. And they um, uh, and the populations of Crisp and Wilcox combined in Oconee County were within a couple of hundred of each other. It was almost identical, so we had an easy basis for comparison. And I'm going from memory here, but Oconee County, um, for the last year we had data for, generated something like forty-four million dollars in income tax for the state of Georgia, and consumed about eleven million dollars in Medicaid cost. Crisp and Wilcox combined, again, with about the same population, was the reverse. It consumed about 11 or 12 million, or it generated about 11 or 12 million in taxes and consumed over 40 million in, in Medicaid expenses. And I had a slide that I used around that that would usually cause a lot of eyebrows to go up in a room. Um, and, uh, but I, as in looking at that, I thought, man, there's just more to this story than just this. And I began fiddling with it even before I retired and, and just sort of kept going. The other route really goes back 40 years to my newspaper days. You know, the paper every once in a while would send me out, or I'd wind up going out in the state on one story or another. And in the, you know, the 1970s, there were communities all over the state that were perfectly fine places to live in. Mid-sized cities and small towns that were very pleasant and they had, you know, they had a little hospital and they had what they needed. Um, and over time, as I would, every few years, wind up going back someplace, those pictures were not getting better. So that sort of time-lapse photography in my mm -hmm. mind, combined with, with, uh, with the experience coming out of that public health campaign, convinced me that there was that this was a bigger story, and and a and a strategic problem for the state. I, I became convinced that people did not fully appreciate the magnitude of the problem or the potential cost and consequences of the problem. And you know, so really what I was trying to do, and I set out trying to write a book, and I'm, I'm, I hope I can still get that done, but the, but the blog has sort of taken on a a little bit of a life of its own, and maybe accomplishing what I set out to do, which was try to stimulate, attract some attention to the problem, and stimulate a thoughtful discussion around uh, around how you, how you deal with it. Uh, and it's a really hard nut to crack. And I don't, um, um, I, I, I'm not sure that I see the the light at the end of the tunnel yet. So. Um, uh, in any event, but uh, it's you know it, it's um, uh, it's it's been an interesting exercise. I think I've spent way too much time wallowing around in data, <laughs> but um, uh, I've got the time, so I'm working on it. So anyway, is is that rural, that rural urban divide isn't unique to Georgia? Ab oh, absolutely not. It's we're a microcosm of the rest of the country, without a doubt. Absolutely, without a doubt. What makes Georgia a little different, um, I think, I'm not sure, and I, I, I would need to do a lot more research to, to say this with any certainty, but I think we're different 
because we've got Metro Atlanta mm-hmm. and the rest of the state. Um, and, you know, most other states, you've got like Florida and North Carolina, they've got a, a number of, um, of prosperous urban areas um, that are, that are uh, serving, if you will, their surrounding rural areas. Now, is that any better than what Georgia's got? I don't know. I, I would have to really sort of dig into the into the data, but I think that that uh, the hmm. the metro metro Atlanta to me is sort of evolved as a something approaching a, a a cosmic black hole. I mean, it is sucking up all of the the economic uh, power in the state, all the most of the educational uh, uh, muscle. Um, and it and the population is dramatically healthier. And um, in 19, the earliest education achievement numbers I've been able to find were for, go back to about 1970. Believe it or not, in 1970, there were only a quarter of a million people in Georgia who had college educations. And, um, and slightly more than half of them are outside of what I define as Metro Atlanta. Mm. And, you know, with a good smattering throughout rural Georgia. Uh, today, over two-thirds of the couple of million college graduates are now in Metro Atlanta. And um, uh, and the education achievement numbers are, are dismal in a lot of these, a lot of rural counties. Compounding that problem is that the rural areas are not sending kids to college. Mm in the numbers that they used to. And that's a fairly new pattern um, going back really about a decade. Why do you think that is? I don't know if it's money. I don't know if it's uh, culture. It's a good question that I don't know the answer to. But um, (laughs) there were, uh, maybe I'm going from memory here, but... um, there were, I think it was 71 counties in Georgia that didn't send a single kid to Georgia Tech in, I think it was 2018. 22 counties that didn't send a single kid to the University of Georgia. Um, and the, the overwhelming preponderance of kids that go to both of those big, the big Georgia schools are from Metro Atlanta. Oh, sure. I mean, and, and far outstripping the population relationship, um, and uh, the and, and that 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 continues. The um, uh, Georgia State College and University at Milledgeville is also overwhelmingly a Metro Atlanta uh, based population of students. Um, so you you know you've got that the education disparity that already exists is only going to become more and more dramatic mm-hmm. and um, uh, and at some point you know I, I think we've we've got to face the question of, of are there communities that are literally failing you know you they don't have the critical mass of people tax bases are shrinking economies are contracting um, uh, what's going to happen when when that begins to happen uh, the brain drain has left them without, arguably, without a leadership capacity. So, um, uh, and and those are Republican areas right now that the Republicans in power need to keep happy. How do they do that? I don't know. You know, Brian Kemp set up his r- rural strike team for economic development, and. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see if they can develop, deliver anything to Baker County and Calhoun County and you, areas like that. You remember Kill Townsend? Sure. His, his, one of his hobby horses was consolidation, county consolidation. Um, and the, the courthouse crowds, obviously. Sure. Um, but the cloud of the courthouses are... are much diminished since 19, well, I guess Kill would have come in and probably in the 1960s. He was there until the early 90s. I think Bob Irvin took his 
Did Bob his take his seat? I believe so. Um, yeah, yeah, because Dorothy, there had been some lines drawn, and initially he had run against Dorothy Felton and come very close over the issue of Sandy Springs. Um, and then Kill retired. I think that was around 92. He Did you know him? Did you? No, no, no. He had passed away before okay. I ever became interested in, in Georgia politics or, or Georgia Republican Great politics. Great guy. Great guy. But yeah, I, I, I never, I've never heard anybody say a cross word about him. Very classy, visionary figure. sort of guy. You know, um, uh, very smart. Um, thought about things well beyond his district. He was a, as I recall, a big MARTA proponent. Mm. Um, and I'm sure where you're going is that he was, you know, the one of those guys who was thinking about urban rural issues or rural issues back way before it was cool. I, th I think it was, it was for him and others, it was efficiencies. Here, here was a, 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 a businessman, a lawyer, sort of from a patrician background. Like you, lawyer. Yeah, yeah he, very close to Elbert Tuttle and, and, and Judge Tuttle. Um, and, and the sort of what you would think of is the quintessential Buckhead Republican yep. that came out of the Eisenhower administration, the Eisenhower period, where you know here's a guy who was the, the Rotary Club, but he was he was also the Humane Society, Planned Parenthood, um, sort of a, a, a culturally uh, metropolitan. Um, but was thinking about, as, as you said, thinking about issues and, and how, what affects small, rural, sparsely populated counties really affects the state in the way that state resources are spent. Was it Townsend who during the Harris administration was floating the county consolidation Oh, he, he floated it throughout his, his, his career. I um, remember. So it, it probably would have come up. He was there in the, in, during the Harris years. I probably shouldn't say this with the camera rolling, but my <laughs> recollection that's come back to me is that I think it was Townsend who proposed that and took it to, and was, was talking to the Harris people about it <coughs> and wanted to go around the state and talk about it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And Governor Harris let him do it, but sent state troopers with him to make sure he came back alive. I think I've got that story right. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he was, um, if, if your question is, what do I think about county consolidation? Um, I, even when it was being talked about back then, I never thought it was a silver bullet. You know, I thought, yeah, you can gain some efficiencies around the edges, but... You know, it, it, and it's especially true now, if you put together two or three or four impoverished um, uh, counties that are shrinking, you know, do you just have one big one like that? Well, and, and, it, 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 the efficiencies found are at the, at the municipal levels, not necessarily Medicaid dollars consumed. Well, like no, it's true, but you, you, you'd have one sheriff instead of three or four and arguably a, a few less county commissioners and, and court clerks and that sort of thing. And I, you know, I, I just, I don't know that that's going to save that much money. It's probably worth doing. I will tell you that I was, um, a couple of years ago, I was down in Southwest Georgia talking to people and I think I was in Randolph County. I think it was Randolph. Mm -hmm. Um, and met with the woman who was the chairman of the, or the volunteer CEO of the, the chamber. Um, and I, and of course, that conversation, I said, have y'all thought about county consolidation down here? And she said, you really do want to get shot, don't you? And I, no, not really, but, <laughs> but so, and so it's still, you know, uh, and I've gotten that reaction in other parts of the state. Right. Now that said, you can find examples of, of cross-county collaboration and cooperation all over rural Georgia. And that's a good thing. And, and that's, if I were in the process of evaluating those, what's going on out there at that level, those that's the sort of thing I'd be looking for. You know, is are there are there instances of that sort of voluntary collaboration mm -hmm. that you might build on? Um, uh, and and there clearly are some born of desperation. And well, desperation. health departments are, are a perfect example. I mean, even even where I'm from in Southern Illinois, I can still remember getting my my meningitis shot at the bi county. 
health department, you know, in, in Southern Illinois, rural, but it, but it was certainly nothing like, like South Georgia. Georgia, the Georgia law requires every county to have its own health department. Hmm. So hmm. I don't know, I'm not a, aware of actual combinations at that level, but it, it would make sense in certain cases. Although what you, public health needs a public presence. It would not make sense to consolidate three or four public health departments in four or five counties the size of a New England state mm. and, and just pull, pull back to one presence in the middle of the whole thing. But, um, or at least I don't think it would. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, um, so uh, it's, you know, consolidation, yeah, there are probably some instances where it would make sense. Um, I don't think it's a, it's a cure. I right. really don't. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how, how Kemp um, and the, his Republican colleagues tackle those problems. Right. Well, is, uh, is there anything else you'd like to, to record for posterity while, while I have you here? Um, we've covered a lot of territory. I'm, I should probably shut up while the, while the shutting up is good. So I appreciate the well, Charlie, interest. Well, thank you very much uh, on behalf of the, the Russell Library and everybody at the University of Georgia. Uh, thank you for participating in this uh, two-party Georgia oral history interview. Glad to do it. Glad thank, to do it. Thank you, Thank sir. you.